So my name is Rick Steeds, I'm one of the cardiologists at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and I'm part of the Ulstrom service and have been in Birmingham for the last few years. I know many people here. It's been my job to summarise the scientific symposium yesterday. So we start off the afternoon with Professor Tim Barrett who uh, is the lead clinician at Birmingham Children's Hospital for the Ulstrom service and he outlined the pathway and discoveries of Alstom syndrome for the early 50s uh, and, and really suggest that there were four steps in improving um, the service and improving uh, the treatment of patients over the forthcoming years that he could see in the future. And those focused really on improved clinical care. And he put that in the context of a growth in the numbers of patients with Alstom syndrome coming into Birmingham saying that there were 38 under regular review but that 50 people had been seen and some of those of course have transitioned through the adult clinic with us. Within those multidisciplinary team clinics there are obviously some advantages and the main advantages are that the patients are the focus so um, we as clinicians get used to lots of people coming to individually to us but actually under these circumstances you really take round a group of us who are all in one place. And that has advantages that uh, Professor Barrett has audited and has identified that over the time of the service in Birmingham, this has resulted in improved sugar control, in terms of improved weight control, and in terms of lipid control. He identified a second step being the planning of treatments to slow down progression of disease and outlined a number of steps that he thought important for drug discovery, including really to, to lay down a clear understanding about the natural history of Ulstrom syndrome and that actually then what you needed was a biomarker that could be measured to identify the effect of any drug that was going to be proven, that that, that drug should have a target against which to act and that there would then be cell studies before inpatient studies, before dose titration studies and then potentially leading up to randomised controlled trial as all the steps necessary for drug therapy and drug treatment. He also outlined that some of those steps have already taken place. So he highlighted Jan Marshall and Richard Paisley's paper from 2005 as a very clear outline of the natural history of Ulstrom syndrome and also highlighted that both on histological samples and also on imaging samples we understand that fibrosis is potentially a core biomarker that's a, not only a way to measure it, changes in the, in the disease but also the effects of drugs on that disease. And he also highlighted three or four areas where he thought there was potential um, space for drug development, including a process called endosome recycling. He then really talked about in the future. So the ideal thing is to be able to reverse damage that's already pre pre present and then the potential to prevent damage from ever taking place, which of course is the most important thing for the patient. And that's also the hardest thing. So while the drug steps are important and that they may slow down progression, they may reverse damage, although it's unusual for drugs mostly to do that, he looked and suggested about um, evidence in, this, in, a, in something called a CRISPR gene editing technique, which he thinks is going to provide new avenues for drug development rather than being a way of modifying the disease process. He went on to talk about a couple of big processes that are going on in Birmingham. One is to seek approval from something called the National Institutes of Health Research Bioresource. So this is a free process um, subject to, to grant approval where there is a standardised biosample collection that are then sent into a central facility where they do something called metabolomic analysis. And effectively what they do is they study a whole cascade of metabolomic markers in blood and then they use advanced computers to identify changes in standard metabolic pathways that we know are present in normal health and see if you can characterize differences in patients with rare diseases like Holstrom's disease that may highlight new entities that can be targeted for treatment. It doesn't rely on a hypothesis it's looking at changes from what is expected and is centralised so it brings to bear huge resources that we do not have and there is an application in process from Birmingham. He also highlighted something that particularly at the Birmingham Children's Hospital which is that there is an internationally respected patient reported outcomes department in Birmingham at the university and that what they try to do is they develop some elicitation of concepts for patient measure, measurement of patient 
outcomes, for standardised questions to make sure that patients, what, patient, what patients want and what they expect out of services is standardised, and then a comprehensive review over a period of time to see whether those changes and expectations from patients um, can, be, can, can, can help to formulate services, really. I think it's a bit horrifying that actually the point of this is really to find out what you think the problems are rather than what we think your problems are and how your opinion about your problems might change as people get older or, or they become unwell or they, they, their, their circumstances change. Uh, and it's a little bit shocking to think that we don't really have a good handle on that. Prof Barrett then handed over to Dr Hywatt and he talked very much about the theory of metabolic syndrome in Ostrom's um, disease. And he has a very clear idea based on, I think, on Rob Semple's work, which is that we know that at the core of one of the problems in patients with Ostrom syndrome is that they get scar tissue forming in fat cells. And there is a general upregulation of genes responsible for scar tissue. And that that seems to be coordinated with insulin resistance, which is disproportionate people's weight or body mass index. And it's felt, his theory is, that because of adipocyte dysfunction, there is an overspill or a toxic lipid overspill that ultimately ends up in accelerated liver disease and potentially in premature kinetic disease. He outlined the study aims behind the PBI 4050 drug. Uh, really in two ways because it's not simply to see if the drug works but it's also been very much to see if it can shed more light on the theory of toxic overspill and, and, and adipose tissue failure and highlighted some of the techniques that Dr. Baig is using including um, microdialysis of fat cells, fat cell biopsies and different ways of looking at uh, the performance of cells under very and, and, and the body under very specific metabolic control with something called a hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamp. He talked about recruitment. So far, 12 patients have from, with Ulstrom syndrome have been included. There are also 12 patients within bardo beadle syndrome who've contributed, and there are a group of polygenic obese people who have also been included. So far. He's in preliminary results have suggested that actually it's interesting patients with Ulstrom syndrome. Well, the perception is that obesity is part of this, that actually uh, the obesity is less than seen in Bardo Beadle and in the polygenic obese population, that they do have disproportionately severe insulin resistance, and that the extent of fat cell fibrosis may not be as overwhelming as previously thought, but may be variable. And that certainly we've seen early evidence that the metabolism of these fat cells is definitely disordered compared to other groups with insulin resistance and obesity. Lindsay Folks, that's right. Lindsay Folks from Prometic, I'm very sorry, I'm slightly embarrassed about that, <coughs> gave us an update on PBI 4040 and the results after. Uh, and she started off by highlighting a recent other study that, they've, that, that Prometic have performed in patients with type 2 diabetes and highlighted that after 12 weeks there was a significant improvement in diabetic control in those who used the drug, that there was an improvement in uh, liver function really as, a, as, a, as, a, as an incidental reduction in markers of liver stress and similarly reduction in markers of renal stress in the kidney and stabilise of renal, renal function. She pointed out that the 24-week safety study had been completed. There were only two serious adverse events, neither of which are thought to be related to the study drug. One was an episode of gastroenteritis, one was a respiratory tract infection. There is now entry into an extension phase which is going to go on for a further 36 weeks. And the interim eff eff efficacy analysis suggests that the drug does reduce liver fibrosis according to FibroScan measurements. There is a normalisation of the liver enzymes. There is some improvement in insulin sensitivity and there is some reduction in biomarkers of kidney injury, but it's still early days and that's only an interim analysis. Uh, we then went on to um, Professor Johnson and his PhD uh, fellow, uh, Rebecca Perrin, who really outlined um, current research, which I think it's fair to say is very much in progress in terms of their specialisation in investigation into th ciliopathies. 
So cilia are little wiggly bodies that sit in the bottom of many cells and cell membranes and are important for a host of transport uh, and uh, trafficking function within the human body and human cell. Uh, and, and really outline work of gene identification in a number of rare diseases, but more importantly, they're working currently on looking at uh, structure and function of ciliopathies, and in particular, Ulstrom syndrome. So they're about to use this process called CRISPR, which is where you can extract, you can implant or replace the Ulstrom gene and look to see how that changes the structure and function of cilia under extremely high resolution imaging systems. Dr. Paisley, I think, was fair to say what we would really like to do is for them to come back next year for us to tell the results, because it seemed to be pretty preliminary. We then uh, had a masterful lecture by uh, Professor Maffei from Italy, who talked about global research in Ulstrom syndrome in three, three contexts, really. First, in metabolism, secondly, in atherosclerosis, and thirdly, in brain. And talked and gave good examples of how much there is a variation in phenotypic appearance between patients and, and, and postulated this is not only an, a differential effect of the potential gene defects, but also an impact of environmental circumstances. And that was reflected in the fact that we have a concept that Ulstrom syndrome is heavily biased towards insulin resistance, but that his evidence also suggests that unlike many other people with type 2 diabetes and true insulin resistance, there is also an element of pancreatic failure. He talked uh, of great, with great interest to me, particularly about the role of something called circulating progenitor cells and endothelial progenitor cells. So these are cells that are really released from the bone marrow. So they are, these are uh, quintessentially stem cells that traffic down towards areas of damage, both and, and are, seem to be increased in patients with Ostrom syndrome. And their, their activity is related to um, a risk of ischemia and also the presence of ischemia, uh, presence of, sorry, atherosclerosis based on the measurement of something called intimal medial thickness, which is actually the thickness of your artery and the thickness goes up when you've got atheroma or fatty deposits on the inside of the artery. Found a potential association between EBC, EPC and CPC activity and potentially with progression towards atherosclerosis and Ulstrom syndrome. And then finally, fascinatingly, he looked at pictorial changes in diffusion um, in the brain. So that brain activity imaged under, under high magnetic power clearly shows differences in brain map activity between Ulstrom patients and controls. And then highlighted some very interesting work using some detailed uh, psychometric testing. I'm slightly shady on the details but fortunately he's here so if you want to ask some questions you can ask him. One of the things that I found most interesting and that I'd like to finish is that actually he can't com com discuss the option of particular problems with movements around the mouth in patients with Ulstrom the syndrome that he picked up and it's something that our respiratory physician Sham Madatil's often commented because for some reason many patients with Ulstrom syndrome can't cope with the spirometry, which is where you test for lung function. So one of the things that he pointed out is whether people can whistle. So can I just ask everyone here who's got Ulstrom syndrome if you can whistle to me? OK, let's do a control experiment. Everyone who does not have Ulstrom, can you whistle for me? Right, OK. The guys with Ulstroms whistle better. Right, OK, all right. Just interesting vox poll. So that's, that's my summary. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for asking me to do so.